I'd like to, to uh, welcome you all here uh, th this evening on behalf of Joe Byrne, who unfortunately is not able to be with us uh, th 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 this evening. So I was asked if I could just uh, very uh, br br briefly uh, welcome you all and uh, just take a moment to introduce the person who is going to introduce our speaker for, 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 for this evening, and that's Mr. D D D Duff um, M Montgomery, who's the uh, D D Deputy Minister of uh, of the Department of Health uh, Pro Promotion and uh, Pro Pro Protection. I must say, during the uh, almost three years that I've been here um, at Dal, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. Uh, uh, <laughs> my name is Will Webster, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Health Professions at Dalhousie University. And during the almost three years that I've been here, I have really enjoyed the interactions that I've had with uh, D D D Duff. He is someone with lots of energy, lots of ideas. We had him speak last year at the full, f full uh, f f f faculty meeting um, for the Faculty of Health uh, pro pro Professions. And I know that everybody very much enjoyed uh, what he had to, to, to say. So uh, I, I'm not, uh, th this evening is not about me. And so with those very few uh, words, I'd like to, uh, to ask uh, D D Duff if he could uh, c come up to introduce our speaker for this evening. Thanks very much, uh, Will. It's for me. It's a it's a privilege to be here. Um, I was just telling Sarah, Dr. Kirk, that uh, Minister Burnett and I recently returned from Scotland, where their government hosted a major conference around health inequities and other issues involving the European Union, the World Health Organization, and many countries uh, in Europe. And it was absolutely exciting to be able to share with them some of the things that we're working on and some of the things that we're talking about. And one of the key and most fundamental issues is obesity. So it's with a real pleasure and a great honor to introduce you to Dr. Sarah Kirk. Dr. Kirk has kindly agreed to take time from her hectic schedule to join us tonight to present our weight on our minds, obesity in Nova Scotia. As the Deputy Minister of the Department of Health Promotion and Protection, I am very much looking forward to Dr. Kirk's presentation and how it will help inform some of our initiatives underway to help more Nova Scotians to be healthier. Here is just a hint as to why we are so fortunate to have Dr. Kirk with us. She holds a Canada Research Chair in Health Services Research within the School of Health Administration at Dalhousie University and a cross appointment with the IWK Health Center. The management and prevention of obesity is the focus of her research, and Dr. Kirk is particularly interested in how obesity is managed within the health setting, as well as understanding the contribution of the obesogenic environment to the development of obesity. Dr. Kirk is a United Kingdom registered dietitian by profession. She has previously worked in nutrition and health research at the University of Leeds, United Kingdom, before moving to Canada. She's also part of the United Kingdom National Institute for Clinical Excellence Guidance Development Group that produced national guidance for obesity prevention for England for the first time in 2006 and co-author of a Cochrane Collaboration Systemic Review on Health Professionals Management of Obesity. Wow. wow. And really, the good news on a personal note is she's here in Nova Scotia. And more important, and my staff, Michelle Romero, is here, the coordinator of, of healthy eating for our department, indicates that Sarah's in constant contact with us and her, her, we with her about what are some of the things we can do together to better understand some of the challenges we face in this province. So please welcome Dr. Kirk. Thank you very much, um, Doug, for those very kind words. And thank you all for coming today, for this evening, for uh, this presentation, especially with it being such a beautiful day outside, a real true Nova Scotian spring day, I hope, <laughs> although I gather it's not always like that. Um, so I'm here to, this evening to talk about um, obesity, a weight on our minds, obesity in Nova Scotia. And I'm going to start with a definition. We really don't like, I don't actually like the word obesity, and, I'm, and I know that it's not a, a word that particularly um, is popular with other people. It holds a lot of value um, judgments, and, uh, and it isn't, it, it's something that people do feel quite uncomfortable with. 
but it is the definition that we use, and that's why I'm going to use it in my presentation tonight. But here's some of the things that people have said about obesity, the O word. The World Health Organization in 1997, that's over 10 years ago, uh, described obesity as today's principal neglected public health problem. And it's been described by Professor Philip James from the International Obesity Task Force as one of the most important medical and public health problems of our time. And given the prevalence of childhood obesity and given its contribution to many diseases, this is the first generation that may not live as long as their parents. That's a quote from the report by Dr. Kelly Leach, the Federal Advisor for Children and Youth that came out just a few weeks ago. So obesity is a major public health problem. And I'm hopefully going to explain a little bit more about that over the course of this evening. I'm going to use the World Health Organization definition of obesity, which is a body mass index, or BMI, um, or, or, um, is a, which is a simple index of weight for height used to classify overweight and obese uh, obesity in adult populations and individuals. Now, BMI is defined as weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. So you need to have a math degree to be able to actually work it all out. But once you do, what you find is if you have a figure above 25, you'd be classed as overweight. If your BMI is over 30, you're classed as obese. And if we look at the rates of obesity in Canada at the moment, what you see in the, the top right corner is the um, obesity rate. This is defined as the BMI over 30. For women and men, it's around about 23%. But what you can also see on the left of the slide is the, 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 the rate in Nova Scotia and in Atlantic Canada in general. And we have a higher prevalence rate in, in uh, Atlantic Canada than the rest of, um, rest of Canada. And that's a concern. But really, to actually understand what this means, we have to look back in time, go back to 1985, where we have figures um, of, of obesity that were less than 10%. And I want you to watch closely, because this graph does move quite quickly. And what you'll see is um, the color changing as obesity rates increase. And you're looking for the, uh, the color red. And look when that actually happened. So we had a doubling of obesity rate in this region in the year 2000. So in less than 15 years, our obesity rate has doubled. And it's also a problem with children and youth. These are figures, again, from the Communi Canadian Community Health Survey, which shows that Nova Scotian children and youth are the, within the top five of, uh, of obesity rates in Canada. Um, in fact, the Atlantic province, again, are within the top five. So we do have um, a problem with, with the overweight and obesity rates in our children. But why should we worry? Well, we do know, and you know, I think a lot of people still view obesity as, a, as, as an issue of you know, cosmetic or a lifestyle issue, something that isn't really that um, dangerous to our health. It's just maybe something that you know, feels a bit uncomfortable. But we now know, we have a lot of evidence now, that obesity is associated with a range of chronic conditions. And I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching to the converted a little bit here, because uh, I know I recognize a few faces in the audience anyway. But the kind of conditions that we're seeing are diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension. These are the top three conditions um, that, that affect the, the, the Canadian healthcare system. Nova Scotia also has the highest rates of cancer in, in uh, the whole of Canada, and cancer is also associated with, with, with obesity, certain types of cancer at least. Now, 70% of people who have a, a weight problem will also have at least one chronic condition. And if anybody of you, any of you came to um, Ken Rockford's lecture, you'll know that our healthcare system isn't actually designed to deal with people with more than one health problem at a time. And money always talks. And so here we have the health budget, which already consumes 46% of total spending in Nova Scotia. These are figures are from the, um, the recent Provincial Health Services Operational Review, which is equally as worthy as my title, I think. <laughs> now, I'm a dietitian by training, as, as you've already heard. And when I was training back in the old days, we, found, we, were, we were taught that obesity was a simple condition. And, and actually, if you look in the medical dictionary, what you'll see is the term simple obesity used there. And what it's defined as is obesity resulting when caloric intake exceeds energy expenditure. So it's a simple thing of balance. Energy in is too high, um, energy out is too low, and you will gain weight. Now I'm here to argue that there is nothing simple about obesity. That's one of my key messages. And to, to explain why I, I feel that, because I th think obesity is a very complex condition, and we 
we don't actually, I think, really appreciate how complex it is. I'm here to talk about the, the individual and how we need to move beyond the focus on the individual because the individual is only a part of, of, a, a, of the whole picture and there's a whole load of other very complex things going on around obesity development. And this is a complex problem and in that, in, in the, that regard it needs complex solutions. So there is nothing simple about obesity. It's not a new phenomenon. We've had obesity for, for a, um, a very long time. In fact, this, uh, the first quote is from uh, Hippocrates, Hippocrates himself, not an easy word, um, who said, corpulence is not only a disease itself, but the harbinger of others. And Thomas Short in 1727, who said, I believe no age did ever afford more inst instances of corpulency than our own. And William Banting in 1863, and what was uh, has often quoted as being the first diet book, a low carbohydrate um, diet with the catchy title of A Letter on Corpulence Addressed to the Public. <laughs> so, and actually you will find quite often that um, <coughs> it's the Atkins diet people are the ones who, uh, who often quote William Banting. So we've seen this incredible increase in our rates of obesity, a doubling in 15 years. What can we do about it and what do we need to know to understand why this has happened? And we, really, we need to go back even further than 1985 to get an idea of what, why this is. We need to go back to literally to our hunter-gatherer days when that existence that we had, and, and which we had for, for you know, vast amounts of time, required us to do large amounts of daily physical activity to obtain the food that we, we then ate. And at that time, food was not available. We didn't know that we were going to you know, find whatever buffalo or bison or whatever it was that we were going to be eating. And so the instinct was to eat food when it was available and store the, the energy as fat for when the times were lean. And hunter-gatherers would have literally travelled miles and miles and miles in order to get um, to the, the, the food that they needed. So this was an essential survival mechanism for an unpredictable food supply. If we, if we didn't find food, we needed to have some way of, of literally staying alive. And so physical activity was driven by the need to eat, and that's a really important point. And I'll come on to what's going on in a, in a moment. So that's about two million years of our, of our existence um, when we were hunter-gatherers. Agriculture actually only appeared around 10 to 12,000 years ago, and that's a blink of, of the evolutionary eye, if you like. Sugar only appeared 2,500 years ago, and we had a huge change in the way that we um, get hold of food, how food was produced, how food was um, manufactured. That started in the Industrial Revolution, the 18th and 19th centuries, and things really changed over that time. We had rationing in 1940 to 1954, at least in, in the UK, and, and uh, there are certainly uh, occasions where people had um, significant issues around having food restricted in that way. And I'll, I'll just tell you a story of a guy I was, um, I was referred to was when I worked as a dietitian. He was a, a, he was a prisoner of war in a Japanese um, camp. And uh, when, I was referred to, when he was referred to me, he had been referred on the grounds of his morbid obesity. In other words, he was, he was extremely overweight. He actually couldn't get out of his chair. He was, in, he was you know, an elderly gentleman. Um, and when we were talking, I had to go and see him at home because he couldn't actually come into the hospital. When we were talking, he was telling me about how he found it incredibly difficult to control his food intake. He'd been starved for the, the time that he'd been a, a prisoner of war. And so he was finding that when he was trying to, to control his intake, he, he really couldn't do it. So he was overeating and then he was feeling very guilty about that. And this is actually a consequence of starvation. And it's again another example of our biological drive to eat when food is available. And you know, in, in the environment we live in now, that's actually making life very, very difficult for people. And I found this figure as well, which I find a little bit shocking. You know, for all I, I study obesity, I didn't realize that the first McDonald's store actually opened in 1955. So how did we get here? I'm sure you've all seen this photo by now. It's used <laughs> often in, the, in these kind of presentations. Well, we followed a path. Or in the words of Burger King, we had it our way. And we said, make it big. And what you can see here is uh, just two examples of menus that we see every single day. On the right is the quite nauseating BK Quad Burger. I just cannot believe that people <laughs> eat that much food in one go. <laughs> 
And on the left is the uh, is the screenshot from the Eastside Mario website. And what uh, you may not be able to read the the words at the back, but what that actually says is Eastside Mario's gives you all the suitable salad and garlic home loaf you can eat when you order from our Taste of Little Italy entrees and Manhattan menu. And also just below that, um, kids eat free on a Monday. And believe you me, I've taken advantage of that in my time. <laughs> so we said make it cheap. And on the left-hand side, we have um, the burger wars that are going on, Burger King versus McDonald's, to make the $1 cheap, um, sorry, did I say <laughs> the $1 um, double cheeseburger. On the uh, right-hand side, what you can see, uh, again, it's not terribly clear, but with the winter lunches at the cookhouse, you can actually, have, if, if, you, if it isn't served to you within 15 minutes, you get it free. And just below that, there's a free appetizer as well. I don't know where, how you get, get the free appetizer. But food is becoming increasingly cheap. And even though we're actually heading into a global food crisis, I still think that, uh, that these kind of foods are, are, are extremely cheap. And we said make it easy. And I've got a little flashing arrow there over the, uh, the what I think is coleslaw, because that just may or may not be a vegetable in there. <laughs> Um, and interestingly enough, if you try and find the nutritional information for, for this uh, mum's night off feast, it's actually very hard to find. The triple chocolate mud pie, for example, is not listed on the website. Um, and to try and actually work out what the calories are or the, uh, or the fat or whatever in all of these things would be a bit of a challenge as well. And then you have on the right two skinny women who are driving through the uh, drive through there getting some um, fresh and delicious food that's been made the way you want and served the way you deserve <coughs> in your car. <laughs> <laughs> and dining out is now a key obesogenic behavior. It's not something that I did when I was a child. Um, we went out once a year on my mum's birthday mm -hmm. so that she didn't have to cook. And I'm sure she'd have loved that mum's night out feast as well. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> in the last 30 years, the number of fast food restaurants per capita in the US has doubled. Every day, 46% of adults eat out at a restaurant. Not necessarily a sit-down restaurant, it's just maybe just popping in to get your timmies in the morning and your donuts, but it's, it's still a significant number of people who are eating outside the home. Every day, 21% of households are going to take <coughs> out. And just to give you an example of how your diet um, can be influenced, uh, again, uh, it's hard to read these figures, but um, if you were to have um, what I would consider not to be a majorly um, sort of excessive meal at uh, Eastside Man Mario's. In fact, this is something that I would normally have, angel hair primavera that has vegetables in it for a start. Um, a cheesy artichoke dip, <coughs> pasta, salad, and a garlic loaf contains 2,050 calories. Now, we would say that an average um, person should be consuming around about 2,000 calories. Obviously, it depends on your age, it depends on your gender, and it depends on how your level of physical activity. But on average, that's what we would say would be a um, a, a, a sort of a reasonable intake for somebody. Now you're blowing that in one meal if you go out to, to this restaurant. And even if you only had the entree, or what we would call the main course in the UK, you'd still be having 1,340 calories. And the fat doesn't even bear thinking about it, 90 grams in, the, uh, in the, the two of them. And this is the other problem that we have. Before, physical activity was being driven by the need to eat. Now it's the other way around. We're having eating driven by the need to be physically active. And that kind of way doesn't, doesn't work quite so easily. Um, and, and this is a major problem that we have. Only about 50% of adults are active enough for health benefits. And I'll just ask you, how many of you drove around and round and round until you got a car parking <laughs> spot as close as possible to the Lord Nelson? <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> and the barriers to physical activity that people give are a lack of time, a lack of energy, and a lack of motivation. And interestingly enough, these are the same barriers that people give whether or not they're physically active. So even physical active, physically active people will use these barriers. And this figure, I've had six months to get used to this figure, and I'll tell you what, it still shocks the life out of me. 62% of Brits, according to a survey that was done in, um, by the British Heart Foundation last year, would not increase their level of physical activity even if their lives depended on it. Now their lives do depend on it, so, <laughs> you know, it's scary stuff. And I'm just going to give you an example of, of, of why this doesn't work quite so easily, because 
having to do physical activity in response to having the having eaten something, unless you're going to walk to the restaurant, um, you know, and walk for the amount of time you need to. If you were to eat the most popular meal at McDonald's, and this is a Big Mac and fries and a regular Coke, you'd need to walk for around about eight hours slowly, six hours at a medium pace, five hours briskly. Now tell me again, <laughs> how many people are actually doing that realistically? And this is the problem that we have, is that we're trying to get people to do something that's actually not you know, a natural thing to do. We, we, you know, we don't, we, we're not designed to, to have that kind of um, <coughs> way of doing things in terms of our energy balance. Now, the, the <laughs> I always hesitate about whether to put this, this picture in here. <laughs> so I'm always worried I might offend somebody. Being British, I don't like to offend anybody. <laughs> This is a genuine McDonald's advert, shockingly enough. <laughs> You've got to love those brains, honestly. I, I mean, it, it's beyond me, really, how they can come up with these ideas. But this is actually a, a McDonald's advert from Austria. But it really does illustrate a point that we're, we're almost weaning our children onto fast food at the moment. Um, and I, and I, you know, I, I love them for producing it because it's a great one for me to put into my presentations. In the Feeding Infants and Toddlers study that was done in the US in 2004, um, looking at children aged 19 to 24 months, what they did is they, they, they asked the parents um, what, the, what their children were eating on a, a given day, and it's what we, in the, we dietitians would call a 24-hour recall, so it's what they eat in a 24-hour period. In that time, these children, 33% of them, almost well, a third of them, ate no fruit. Almost one in five of them ate no vegetables unless you count fr french fries, which obviously we don't, certainly in the Canada's Food Guide and you in the UK either. 25% of these kids were having french fries and fried potatoes. 27% of them were having salty snacks or chips. And almost half of them were having sweetened beverages. And three quarters of them were having candy and desserts. And there was a study, in the, again from the US last year, only a small scale study, but it found that preschool children were actually more prefer to get food wrapped in a burger wrapper, in a fast food wrapper, um, and they would eat foods, even if it wasn't a food that came from that restaurant, if it was wrapped in that wrapper. So it kind of gives the uh, indication that, you know, kids are, kids are getting very primed to these things. And any of you who have young children will know that by the age of two, if you haven't got their eating habits established then, you're stuffed when they're going to be, when they're in their terrible twos, because they're, that's when they say no to everything. And certainly my kids were, were saying no to everything at that age. Our children and youth are increasingly sedentary. And I, I, I may shock you with some of these statistics, but I'll tell you, I shock myself as well. That I find these amazing, that up to 40% of children under seven years old have a TV in their bedroom. And this increases to well over half um, by the age of, what, from for eight to 16 year olds. And the average child on an average day will spend around four and a half hours looking at a screen of some type, not necessarily a TV screen, but a screen of some type, um, you know, computer or, um, Again, Nintendo, those little things. My kids have just got one of those as well. My goodness me, you know, they they have an attention span of a pea normally, and then you have to send them <laughs> Nintendo, and they're away <laughs> for hours if they got the chance. And there is a correlation between the amount of screen time that children watch and uh, and weight. And again, here you can see in these figures that um, basically what you've got there is obesity rates increasing as screen time um, increases. And um, I'm using data here from the um, Physical Activity in Children and Youth, the PACI study, and um, some of you may, I'm sure, be familiar with this, um, which looked at physical activity um, over in, in, in children in grades 3, 7, and 11 um, to see how many of them are actually meeting <coughs> 60 minutes of moderate to physical, vig vigorous physical activity five or more days per week. And they, looked, they did the study in 2001 and again in 2005. So the good thing is we have, we have data at two time points and we have data across age groups. And what you can see there is that physical activity has dropped over, over the two time points. But it also drops significantly from grade three to grade 11. Um, and in fact, in grade 11, you know, it's, it's, it's under 10% under of um, boys and girls. In fact, actually, I think with the girls, it's about 1%, less than 1% are actually meeting those recommendations. And again, if we can't establish these, these um, behaviours in children and youth, you know, it, it, it gets a lot harder when, as we all know, when we become, 
to an adult. Calories count. I hopefully I've made that, that message loud and clear. I've spent years of my professional career trying to move away from calories because I you know, didn't want to have to focus on, on something that felt very negative. But they do count, and so does cost. And this is another thing that actually kind of you know, um, surprises people. Heavily processed foods are usually cheap. Fruit and vegetables are not. And you can look at what's happened to, to fruit and veg prices in the, in the UK and see that they've gone up by about 160% over the same time period. Um, pop went up by 25%, which was actually over that time period the same rate of inflation. So fruit and vegetables tend to be more expensive. Not always the case, there are some things that you can do to get around that, but on average you'll see that they are. And obesity rates are higher in people from lower socioeconomic groups. And there is a link between obesity and food insecurity that actually seems quite paradoxical. You know, people will say, well, how can somebody who's, who's, who's obese possibly have a problem with food insecurity? I'll just give you, what, uh, you know, what, what, a, what food insecurity actually means, is not having the money to buy nutritious food. So you may have the money to buy, you know, food of some type, but not necessarily good quality nutritious food. And that is a real issue in Nova Scotia. Because low income households are likely to spend between 40 to 80% of their budgets on food. And the food insecurity rates here are higher, significantly higher, than elsewhere in Canada. We're talking, well, of the Canadian Community Health Survey figures were 15% versus 9% in the rest of Canada. And I believe that there's some new figures just come out um, today. Yep, literally today. Um, obviously too late for me to, to incorporate into here. For somebody on a low income, you're looking at a, a, a cost of $550 to $600 per month in 2003 to purchase a, a, a nutritious food basket. So if you haven't got the money, what do you do? I was walking around, I, I, you know, I, I look at things like food prices when I'm going around, um, around the shops. And it is actually incredibly hard to buy um, good quality fruit and vegetables at a, at a reasonable price, unless you do shop outside, you know, shop it within season. Um, so if your child is hungry, what are you gonna do? Dollar burger at McDonald's or two kiwis? I'll use that example because you that's a very simple one because there's two kiwis for 99 cents at the moment in the supermarkets. You know, no contest really. And just to, don't worry too much about the slide, it's a little bit busy, um, but I just want to show you this. This is some work that came out again out of the US. Um, and what you've got is in the top left-hand corner, so in that part of the graph, that is the high energy, low cost foods, okay? So this is basically a graph that's just plotted the cost per calorie, effectively, or, or megajoules in, in this case. And then you've got in the bottom right-hand corner, the um, high cost, low energy foods, and they're all the things, you know, the vegetables. So this just illustrates that these are the kind of foods that, that people will eat. And what the, the Thrifty Food Plan weekly menu is a, a, a concept in the US where they, they basically looked at how you could meet the, the, the government, the U US government recommendations for healthy eating um, at a low price. So you wouldn't actually want to follow this diet because it's pretty unpalatable because of the, the sort of things, you know, um, that are included in there. Um, it isn't the most, wouldn't be the most dairy diet, for example. Um, but it just gives you an example of an idea of, of, of the, the cost of food. So the environment that we have, the foodscape that we, we um, operate in has changed, and it has changed dramatically over the over recent years. But the problem is we're still stuck back in focusing on that individual and, and you know, we treat the individual, we provide advice to that individual and then we send them out into this environment that just undermines everything that we say. And I used to feel this as a dietitian you know, years ago that uh, I, was, I, was, I wasn't equipping my, my patients necessarily to deal with the environment that they lived in. And that was when the environment wasn't quite as, as, uh, as bad as it is now. And so I'm going to, because as it should be around about halfway through my talk, if I'm not rattling through so quickly, I'm going to do a bit of audience participation here. And I want to ask you if you don't smoke, if you put your hand up if you don't smoke. Which is why I put that first, because I thought that that would be a keep your hands up. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought this would be something that would actually, most people these days, smoking is considered to be, you know, um, socially <coughs> unacceptable these days in a way that, you know, you could, I couldn't imagine 20 years ago. So keep your hands up, unless if you manage to eat five or more vegetables a day, as well as not smoking. Okay, because if you do manage.
manage to do that, keep your hand up. If you manage to do 30 minutes or more of moderate to vigorous physical activity five or more times a week, good. That's very promising here. Okay, and that is, that is um, activity that gets you out of breath. So you're not just strolling around. And keep your hand up if you also manage to maintain a healthy body weight. <laughs> okay, you're doing well, actually. I'll tell you one thing, you're doing better than America. <laughs> okay, these are the four healthy lifestyle characteristics that have come out of uh, some research from the, uh, from the US, again. Um, the, these are four things, four modifiable things that we should be doing on a, on a, on a regular basis. Eating five or more fruits and vegetables a day, regular physical activity, not smoking, and being a healthy weight. Now, if you can maintain those four behaviors, you're doing really well. But only 3% of the US adults followed all four common modifiable risk factors, modifiable lifestyle characteristics. Okay, and the reason for that is that it's actually very hard to do, again, in the environment that we live in. And that's, again, coming back to the point that it's actually very hard when we focus on the individual. So why is focusing on the individual not helpful? First of all, it ignores these fundamental changes in our environment and society. It leads to stigma and stereotyping. Um, the, the latest uh, way of describing it is, is weightism, or uh, what I've always known as, as again, from, from the sort of sociological literature, is fatism. And negative views about obesity are widely held in society. Because we believe that it's under their control, we see people who are unable to maintain a healthy body weight as being somewhat lacking in, well, particularly willpower. If we could ever bottle willpower, God, we'd be doing so well. But it's, it's something that we do view very widely in society. These are views that are held by everybody. They view by, they're held by adults and children. Um, and they're also held by health professionals. There's not a lot of work in this area, but the work that has been done does suggest that health professionals do have negative views about obesity. And that interferes with the way that they, they give their care. And I'm just going to give you some examples of this in action. Um, you can't read, again, the text, so I'll, I'll just read it out. But this, this was a, a column in a, a Scottish newspaper, the Scottish Herald, that came out. In fact, I think you've sent it to me, George, if I recall. <laughs> um, but what they say is, fatties, you need to get a grip. Now, that in itself, I think, is, is you know, something that really is not, is not acceptable. And then she goes on to say, I had my own personal encounter with Britain's sprawling fat problem earlier this week while traveling back from holiday. I found myself on a full flight, sat next to an extremely fat woman whose body size exceeded the dimensions of her seat. Would you mind if we left the arm rest up, she asked, explaining that she was rather broad around the hips, an understatement of epic proportions. Now that column generated 95 responses. And those responses were quite amazing. If you, if you, if you get the chance, Google this, and you can, you can look at the... Um, the, the responses because they were some people who were just completely vitriolic against this woman and then there were people who were like I absolutely agree with you we should be charging these, these people double the you know the amount of money for a, in a, an extra cast uh, an extra uh, airplane seat and actually this one I find even worse this one comes from uh, USA Today today and this is a reader's comment and what what they say is um, it, it was about a, an article about um, people had complained about people making fat jokes. Again, you know, it, it's just, I think, unacceptable. But what they had said is there is no greater crime to perpetrate on oneself than being overweight. Being fat is a conscious choice people make. Bad choices lead to obesity. It's extremely irritating to me that overweight people have the gall to become offended when people tell the truth. You know, how could people get away with thinking that and say, and it, or, you know, even worse, like actually expressing it? But these are the things that people believe. Because they believe that obesity is under the control of the individual, they don't actually recognize that, that it, you know, this isn't actually the case. And the environment, as I say, has a, has a major role in this. And I did some work before I came here, funnily enough, <laughs> on obesity. And I looked at um, staff within a, a GP surgery, or the several GP surgeries in, in Leeds. We were implementing an obesity strategy then. This is um, sort of back in the early 2000s. And uh, we were contacting, we got, actually got in touch with all the, um, the uh, um, surgery staff to ask them about what they thought about the strategy and, and the implementation, how, you know, how to, uh, how, how it had, it had any, any influence on their practice. And what they, these are two 
genuine views, and they are from people, and they're not the minority view, let me tell you that. And they said, obese people know they're obese and what the dangers are. They can deal with the problem themselves if they want to. Advice is all that's necessary. Hmm, been doing that for quite a long time and it doesn't seem to be working. If they don't take any notice, they face the consequences, just like smokers, drinkers, and drug users. And then this one just kills me, really. Medicalizing a problem that really needs to medicalizing. Okay. But they are the views that people hold. And uh, again, Dr. Sainz has been to, to Scotland, but to about a year, yeah, a year ago. Um, this is another um, article from the Scottish Herald, <laughs> again, um, where the doctors, the, this is the, the GPs, family doctors, um, uh, were saying that they, they didn't want to have to deal with obesity. So they say, doctors have demanded that targets for dealing with obesity, which earn them cash, should be cut from their contracts. GPs from across Scotland agreed yesterday that lifestyle issues, such as obesity, should be excluded from their incentive pay schemes because they can do nothing about it. A little bit of a you know, defeatist attitude, you ask me, but um, again, it's a common um, sense that people have. And so I have spent, let's say, a lot of my uh, my professional career dealing with the individual, but trying to set that con that individual in the context of the environment that they live in, the people that they work with, or, or the people that they live with. I've tried to take into account the, their biological makeup and their family history, things like that, where they live, the food that they hold, have in their house. I've tried to consider the places that they got they go to work because you know for, for a lot of us we spend a, a lot of our time at work and that's the way that we may eat. How they get to work is important and also the amount of money that they have for their um, food and, uh, and lifestyle. But I've missed a few things out it's fair to say. I never really considered the broader geography and I sure as heck didn't consider this number of, of uh, problems. You can't even read this. This comes from work that the, the U UK government has just uh, done. Again, I, I think it came out last year, but uh, you know, the months kind of <laughs> roll into one. Um, you, you can't read this, but what you can see just within the center there um, is energy balance in the little brown bit. It just looks like a big scribble to me. And so I'll give you, uh, try and overlay a little bit. Again, this is, this is still equally as messy. But what this is, is a map of all the factors that influence obesity, or influence energy balance. And you can see there that there's the physical activity um, environment, there's the individual physical activity, there's the physiology side of things, and, and each of these are quite a big component on their own. There's food consumption, there's food production, there's social psychology, there's individual psychology. There are so many factors, and there is no more complex problem, I think, than, than, than obesity. When you take into account all these different things that are going on, now, I don't expect you to process all that because it's, uh, it's taking me long enough to, to work it out. But um, I, I'll give you a quote from Diane Feingood, and I love this because it really does sum it all up. And she was here actually in Nova Scotia last week presenting at the Diabetes Care Program for, of Nova Scotia's. Um, uh, annual <coughs> knees up that they have and what she says is obesity is not rocket science it is much more complex so of course a complex problem needs complex solutions and um, I'm hopefully now going to explain to you some of the things because you know it sounds very kind of doom and gloom doesn't it I mean, well we're all you know stuffed really because we can't it, it is difficult to focus on the individual but there are solutions there are things that we have to, we can do but we need to start thinking in a different way to the way that we've been doing before so what can we do? I sound like I'm going to educate, legislate, modify, engage, research, and much, much more. I'm going to go through each of these and, and just give you some examples of what sort of things we, we need to do. First of all, we need to educate ourselves and equip ourselves to cope in an obesogenic environment. I'm sure a lot of what I have said tonight actually hasn't been um, particularly new to you, but it's actually just, just sometimes recognizing the environment that we live in, understanding how, how these things influence us. Because one of the things that I found, just from being human in this world, is that we have to learn conscious control of our eating. We don't want to hear that because it's a you know it's a dull message, really, isn't it? But but that is one of the ways that we have to deal with this. So understanding that there there is this environment and understanding that we need to, to function within it is important. And we need to support individual uh, sorry health professionals to understand and manage this complex health problem and move away from this kind of just you know simply focusing on the individual. I'm not saying that's not important. What I'm saying is that that, that individual functions in this, in this world. We can modify aspects of our environment to promote active, healthy lifestyles. We've modified them in the other way, let's face it. So, you know, we can 
change it back again. And one of the things that we could do is actually make healthy choices the easier and cheaper choices. And consider the health impact of changes in broader areas of policy, things like economic development, transportation and planning, because these do have a role to play. And again, I can give you some sort of examples, but um, you know, things like uh, the decision to remove sidewalks, for example, um, you know, I think that was to do with snow clearance, but did anybody think when they made that policy that that would also discourage pedestrians? We can't do anything about the weather. Um, it may be our major preoccupation, but um, you know, we can't actually change it. But what, what we can do is make those sidewalks, make those stairs safer for people to walk on. If we do have sidewalks, then we can make those sidewalks safe um, in other ways. In the UK, my biggest gripe was the fact that people used to park on our sidewalks, our pavements. Um, and I, when I had um, when I had my young children, I had twins, and they would have to. I, would, I couldn't actually get my buggy down a gap that size. You know, my double stroller, as we call them. <laughs> so I would have to go on the road and round and back up again. Um, and people in in, uh, in wheelchairs, for example, as well, wouldn't have been able to get past. But that is actually quite common practice in the UK. That people on the pavement. We could do things like cycle lanes, but again, here we have a cycle lane with a car parked in it. So that poor little, you tiny like, little cyclist in the background there, you know, is going to have to swerve into traffic to get past it. So if we do have these policies, we also need to enforce them. And this one always tickles me. This is the, uh, the IWK, um, where you don't see a sign for, for the stairs there, although I have just put one in there. <laughs> The, the signs for the elevators, and it encourages people to be less physically active. And these are the stairs in the IWK, a little bit, you know, the, the paint's peeling off the wall. Um, and I see somebody from the IWK in the audience there, so I'm <laughs> going to just, just also mention that they, all, they do have a very, very good programme for um, encouraging people to use the stairs in, in the IWK. Actually, they do in the Health Promotion Protection, I noticed as well, when I was there recently. So, um, you know, there are ways that we can encourage these things. We could legislate. I think this is a very thorny <coughs> issue, and it's one that I'm not going to get into tonight because I'm no health health uh, lawyer. Um, but there are again sort of things that, that that people are suggesting, things like just improving labelling on on uh, food <coughs> products, and, and that's something I've really noticed since coming to Canada. Actually, compared to the UK, where we're part of the, we're part of the EU, which you know basically regulated a, an awful lot of stuff, and uh, including labelling. So there are certain things that have to be on a label. Um, and some of those things, it's not always consistent on the labels here, that I, well, certainly that's what I've found. Um, so that's one thing that we could look at. We could look at things like limiting adverts on ch for, ch for children, and, and that's also something that's being discussed. We can look at things like economic incentives or economic <coughs> penalties, um, what people would suggest would be a fat tax. Again, I'm not going to go into that. I have issues with um, taxing something that actually is essential, um, i.e. food, I think there are things that we could do, but I, you know, that is a whole you know, complex problem of its own accord, really. Um, and I've just put there the need to avoid the label the nanny state. I don't know if you know what I mean by the nanny state. This is something that uh, the UK government gets accused of all the time. Um, it's basically being interventionist. If you're too interventionist, then people complain. If you're not interventionist enough, then people complain. And it's actually very hard to get that balance, the middle ground, but, but certainly that's something that, that um, we have a huge debate about in the UK and whether or not, you know, if you, if you impose something on people, you know, are you taking away their basic human rights, et cetera, et cetera. And here's an example of labelling, um, which uh, I just wanted to kind of point out as to, as to why sometimes this can be very complicated. This says, um, again, you probably can't read it terribly well, but a perfect portion. So, hands up, knowing that that's a perfect portion, how, how many of you would eat the whole packet? <laughs> you know what's coming now, don't you? This is the trouble. You, you're primed for my, uh, um, what I'm going to say next. So, that perfect portion on the left, it says 75 grams on the front of the uh, packet. Again, you can't read this at all, but... On the other, on the back side of it, it says nutrition facts per 40 grams. Okay, so on the front it's saying it's a perfect portion, but on the back it's saying it's actually really two portions because it's 40 grams. But if you didn't read the back and you thought, oh, it's a perfect portion, you're going to have almost 500 calories in that packet versus <coughs> what you should have had, which is around 244. So it's it's contradictory, and that's 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 an issue. I struggle, and I've got two degrees. <laughs> I'm trying to think how somebody who hasn't got um, much education would, would, would cope with these things. And marketing is mighty. 
again, these figures shock the heck out of me. The US food industry now spends over 30 billion each year on direct advertising and promotions, more than any other industry. And they tell you that advertising isn't supposed to make you change your behavior. Coca-Cola spends more on advertising, 2.2 billion, than the entire budget of the World Health Organization. So could social marketing be mightier? Now, these are a little bit creepy, I think, but um, <coughs> these are actually um, uh, adverts from the National Obesity Forum in the, the UK. And the, the text says, the eating habits you give your children can last a lifetime. They're very powerful, they're very scary, um, social marketing is, is basically marketing to improve um, something, you know, the, 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 the collective good, if you like. Um, and I think it's a great tool that we have at our disposal now. You know, we, you know the marketeers have, have been using it for, for years, and, and you know, we know that that's had an impact. Um, whether or not we need sort of slightly less in-your-face campaigns, maybe, but, uh, but uh, that's an idea. And I also want to just talk to you about a place in uh, Massachusetts in the U.S. It feels like I'm using an awful lot of U.S. data here, but that's because they've done a lot of research. Um, and Somerville, Massachusetts, has a population of around about 78,000. And like many other places in the U.S., they recognized that they were having a problem with obesity, and particularly the obesity rates in children. So they did, and they got in touch with a university researcher, and I'm not trying to tout my <laughs> services here. <laughs> just realized how that sounded. Um, they got in touch with this university researcher and they said, we want to do a community-wide intervention um, and we'd like you to evaluate it. And so that's what they did. Now these changes weren't expensive. They weren't massive things that they tried to do. But what they decided on was painting crosswalks with reflective paint so the cars could see them and, uh, and, and obviously the, the pedestrians could see them. Now that's also very difficult in, uh, in Nova Scotia when certainly in the winter I've you know, noticed with all the salt that goes on the roads, it's very, it actually can be quite difficult to see those kinds of um, things. Um, but they also did things like menu changes in restaurants. They did school-based interventions, including a safer route to school um, uh, program. And they had tremendous community participation. And one of the key things to getting that participation was getting somebody at the, the, the it was, a, I think, the mayor or the, certainly the head of, head of the, uh, um, the government there, who um, really embraced this and decided that he was gonna, gonna support it. <coughs> And it's an example, really, they, they, they've only been doing this for a couple of years, three, three or four years, maybe. Um, they've only got data from one year. Um, but it just highlights that, that change can happen. They did, did see a reduction in, um, in rates of obesity over, over the one-year evaluation, We're waiting for further evaluation to come out. But with the support, with everybody doing it, um, everybody being engaged, this is where things can actually change. And I'll give you an example of something that that I did before I came here that was the opposite of this, if you like. I actually um, have always wanted to walk my children to school, um, and I lived in, I chose where I lived so that we would be close to the school. And I somehow got talked into, this was the year before we moved over here, so it was probably not a good thing to be the head of this before I left to move to Canada, but anyway. I, um, I was passionate about it, so I decided that um, on the request of the school principal that I would set up a walking bus so that my kids could walk to school. Now my kids weren't happy with me because I actually had to start the bus, which meant walking further than we actually lived from the school. Start the bus and walk my kids all the way back. So we were walking quite, quite a long way in, in the end. Um, and the, the purpose of it was to encourage children to, to walk to school rather than drive. Um, what actually happened was that all the mums who also walked to school, or parents, I mean it actually was all mums, but I don't want to be kind of stereotypical there, but um, everybody who actually already walked to school joined the bus and they walked with it and we all kind of walked to school with our little reflective um, jackets on um, and everybody who drove to school continued driving to school <laughs> and they just drove past us and they went and parked outside the school gates and they dropped their kids off and off they went to do whatever they wanted to do and the thing that didn't work was because we didn't have everybody's support we didn't have um, for example traffic enforcement coming out and stopping people from parking right outside the school gates and these people were actually parking where they shouldn't have parked as well let me just tell you it wasn't somewhere they could go. So they were parking on the double yellow lines, as, which is the thing that tells you that you're not allowed to park. Um, we didn't have crossing guard either, so you know, and all of these things that could have actually helped this to work weren't in place. And that's why it's so important to engage everybody and to have that, that level of commitment. But here in Nova Scotia, we're not letting the grass grow beneath our feet. That's the only, <laughs> only picture I could find to, to represent that. But, uh, 
Um, and one of the wonderful things about being here and um, seeing so many faces in the audience that I recognise is that we are small enough to actually be able to do a lot of these things and make a difference. And there's a huge amount of stuff going on in Nova Scotia that, that, that I'm really pleased to be um, involved in. Um, I wasn't involved in the Provincial Health Service Operational Review, but obviously there's, you know, the, that is probably the, um, the major thing that's come out um, this year. There's a Healthy Eating Nova Scotia strategy, um, and I'm uh, on the, uh, the steering committee for that at the moment, which is a, a real honour. We have an Active Kids Healthy Kids strategy, and we have a school food and nutrition policy that is really leading the way in, in Canada um, in, in the policies that they're putting in place within our schools. We have a healthy living tax incentive. Um, again, I'm taking advantage of that, but uh, you know, it's, 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 it's something that is a, a, a good start. And we've also recently had, or, or I think it's actually due in May, the beginning of May, the, the minimum wage increase. So these are really, really hopeful, good things that are happening. And I just want to explain a little bit about the research that I'm doing to give you some context of, of where I'm coming from with all of this. Um, I'm part of a project um, which is really innovative. It's uh, called Optimizing Investments in the Built Environment to Reduce Youth Obesity. The principal investigators for the project are Rene Lyons from Dalhousie um, Atlantic Health Promotion Research Centre and Jill Grant from Planning. So this is two people from Health Promotion, one from Health Promotion, one from Planning, um, we have engaged a whole range of stakeholders within this project and in fact there's an innovative policy stream which is supported by Nova Scotia Health Promotion and Protection and the Atlantic Networks for Prevention Research that is um, enabling us to actually look at some of the policies that are in place within Nova Scotia and ways that we can, we can address that. We're doing a mixed methods design to capture how youth are actually interacting with their environment. So we're taking it a little bit of a step further than, than we've done before. Um, it sounds a little bit big brotherish when uh, when you try to explain to people because we have GPS units, you know, like you have in your car, sat nav type thing, that we're strapping onto kids, pushing them out and seeing where they go, seeing how they actually interact with their environment in terms of the um, places that they go to be physically active or not, um, and the places that they go to eat. Um, they can turn them off, by the way. So it's uh, you know, although it sounds big brotherish, you know, they have control over what what, what they um, do. And I'm uh, also doing some work um, funded by the IWK Scholar Award uh, to look at the creating a landscape of factors associated with obesity in Nova Scotia. Um, this, this actually um, came up before the, uh, the previous project that I described. Um, and so what we're doing uh, is now looking at younger children. We haven't actually agreed what, what age we were going to be doing. We we're going to do children, but when we discovered that the other project was going to look at um, junior high school age kids, then you know, we decided the younger age group would be the best use of time and resources for this. Um, and what it will do, when we get an idea of what's going on in terms of the, the, the childhood um, landscape, and, and just bearing in mind that you know, the, the, the obesogenic landscape of adults is different from that of children, just because you know, children are different from the other group. Um, but what it will do is it will help us to understand some of the things that we may be able to do to actually target um, um, interventions more effectively. And I don't want you to get too bogged down with this either, it's a lot of text again. Um, but an important part of the work that I'm doing at the moment is also identifying the gaps. And what you can see here is uh, what we call ANGELO, the um, Analysis Grid for Environments Linked to Obesity. It came out of work from, from Australia. And what they did with the ANGELO framework is that they divided, it, divided it, our um, environments into the macro setting and the micro setting, or sec uh, micro setting being um, the immediate environment, your sort of you know, neighbourhood, your home, your workplace, sort of smaller scale um, settings. And the macro sector being the broader things like media, like food production, um, you know, the sort of wider concepts if you like. And there are four levels of environment. You've got the physical environment, that's what is available, so parks, recreational spaces, um, food stores, etc. You've got the economic environment, what is the cost. You have the political environment, what are the rules. And you have the social culture environment, what are the attitudes and beliefs. And what you can do is you've got food and activity within there. And so what we've done, well not me personally, but my research assistant, <laughs> is actually plug in where we've got evidence and where we haven't. And you can see from this that the macro sector is the area that we're lacking. And the reason for that is because it's a lot easier to control at the individual level. And so when we're doing research, we have the individual in front of us, we can see what they're doing. 
And in particular, it's easier to control activity. As any dietitian will know, getting a, an accurate account of what somebody's eating is incredibly difficult. Um, so what we've tended to do is focus on the micro level rather than the, the macro level. And you know, let's face it, doing the sort of macro setting level research is going to be pretty messy. I don't mind messy research. In fact, I actually quite like doing messy research um, because I think that's the sort of thing that answers the questions that we need to answer. Unfortunately, it's actually very hard to get funding for doing messy research. And I mean messy in the context of lots of variables, not being sloppy. <laughs> Qualify that <laughs> to any funders in the audience. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm almost at the end of my presentation now. Um, but other research, of course I'm going to say this, more research is always needed. Um, and I'm going to take the words of Lester Breslow. Does anybody, does anybody know who Lester Breslow is? Okay. Well, he's a, an eminent public health um, physician from the US again. Um, he, he's actually 93 now, so he has retired, but he, um, he uh, is the Professor Emeritus in um, UCLA. And he says, it is important to define more precisely the relationship between overweight and excessive mortality. There is a need for better measures of overweight itself, investigation of the significance of specific nutritional elements, long-term observation of individuals who gain, maintain, or lose substantial amounts of weight at different periods of life, and many other studies. Now, I think... I agree with pretty much everything that he says there. I don't know about you. But the sad thing is, he wrote that in 1952. So I think we have moved on a little bit, but there's still a lot to do. But I also take the words of Professor Phil James again from the International Obesity Task Force in my final slide to say that we can no longer afford to wait. If we fail to act until we have the perfect solution, then it will be too late. I think there comes a time when we can say we have to go on the evidence that we have rather than the best possible evidence. Um, it's something that uh, you know, certainly I feel very passionately about. That, uh, you know, yes, I'm a researcher, I want to do research, but I think we need to also accept that, that there's, some of the solutions are there. We just need to go for them. And I'm just going to close with uh, some acknowledgements. First of all, to my colleagues at Dalhousie University and the IWK Health Centre, and to the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, um, who fund my CRC, Canada Foundation for Innovation, who have um, provided infrastructure funding, and the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation, who have provided me with some capacity building grants as well. And to my um, research assistants, Tara Penny and uh, Lisa Cram, who are in the audience, and Carol Obure. Um, and we call ourselves the Applied Research Collaborations for Health, because we hope that that actually reflects the kind of thing that we want to, to do as a research group, which is talk to people, do good policy relevant research. We're a different type of arch for those of you who've got a McDonald's arch card. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, can I take some questions if anybody wants to stress me out even more? <laughs> yes. Can I make one comment? Mm -hmm. <coughs> the poverty, the, the high price of, of food, and the, <coughs> the unhealthy advertising, those are huge, huge factors. But if I make a comment that is less positive, I wonder if you're open to that too. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I found that uh, perhaps the presentation could have included a bit more emphasis on the responsibility of the individual okay. to deal with this problem. The same as those people who have a, a heart problem and it is upon them to do a number of things to, uh, to, to do that. I thought it, it would be helpful to hear a more balanced uh, view in that sense. Right. Okay. And uh, I will be the first to admit that this is my perception, but it is my perception. That's a very good point. I don't know if you all heard that in the back, um, basically wanting to um, uh, know more about the individual and, and maybe having a bit more balance between the environment and the individual. And I think that, that is a good point. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm here to make a point. Um, and the point is that I think we have focused a lot on the individual for a very long time. Um, and yes, individuals do have changes that they can make. But I think those changes are very hard to do unless we do consider the environment. So, uh, so thank you for that comment. I, I, I take it on board. Do you want to 
Sarah, would you care to comment on the issue of control, the addictive, perhaps, nature of this and how um, somebody who is a smoker who makes a brave step of stopping smoking often substitutes something else, mm -hmm. such as eating. Mm -hmm. is it, would you care to comment on that? That's absolutely true, yeah. Um, there's a lot of debate around whether food is addictive. Um, I I struggle with this one again because I think food is you know, you know food is not just nourishment; it's all sorts of other things as well. We have we, we get a lot of um, emotional comfort from food. There's a lot of cultural um, significance in food, and I think sometimes our relationship with food does get very muddled. Um, in terms of um, whether it's an addiction, though, that's a that's that is a tricky thing, and, and a lot of the literature does kind of suggest that it's it's more the kind of the psychological sort of uh, connotations and the food itself, which suggests that it's not the food that's addictive, but the, the experience. And uh, with that, you know, I sort of guess I'll use chocolate as an example, because most of us like, I think there's probably not many people, apart from my sister, actually, who doesn't like chocolate. Um, she's weird. But <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, um, th there are some issues there, I think. And, um, and I think food is also very diff different from things like smoking and um, drinking, because we know that um, cigarettes and alcohol are not essential to life. We can, we can live without them. Um, food is, and I think there's always going to be issues around the, our relationship with food just from that, because you know, we can't live without it at the end of the day. And in some cases, people would say they can't live with it. I mean, if it makes any, uh, any difference, this. I, I, I was a dietitian um, specializing in eating disorders. In fact, my, my understanding and my, my passion for obesity came from actually working with eating disorders originally, working with um, people with anorexia and bulimia. And my PhD was around the beliefs that people hold about food because that to me was you know, so fascinating how strongly people could hold beliefs about food. Um, so, uh, but the reason why I, I, I moved into obesity is because I saw a lot of people who had what we call binge eating disorder, which is a, a disorder where they show all the signs of a, somebody who's bulimic, and um, I'm, sure, I'm not sure how you actually understand what bulimia is, but basically that's eating lots of food and then bringing it up or um, vomiting it or purging it through your, your body in some way. Um, the difference with uh, somebody with binge eating disorder is that they would have all those correlates of a, of a bulimic, but they just weren't getting rid of the food, so they had a weight problem. They would go to their doctor, their doctor would see the weight problem and not actually see the, the psychological problem. Um, and so I actually ended up starting a clinic just because nobody else was doing it um, to, to look at those people. But uh, you know, it's it, we have a very complex relationship with food. Yeah. I don't know if that's actually answered your question. Barbara. Yeah, I just wondered if um, did you read any of the research lately about um, um, studies that are suggesting that um, the, the amount of uh, increase in overweight and obesity showing on that really great map um, can't actually be accounted for in um, uh, by in terms of calories in calories out that that um, there needs to be some other additional explanation um, and I'm particularly thinking about a study and I can't remember who who did it but it was a, a man who was studying some who was studying rats and intestinal bacteria oh yeah do you remember that I'm just kind of curious about what you think about sort of the general argument that there must be something else going on, or even what you might think about that particular piece of research. Okay, yeah, it's the one that I'm thinking about. It's not the virus one, then, is it? That's a different one. No, this was something about there are different kinds of bacteria in the intestinal tract, and some of them are better at um, converting down. nutrients into fats yeah. and calories. Um, so basically, the body is more efficient in that case, and, um, and other bacteria that kind of slugs things off, and even with rats, not people, or rats with the, with the bacteria that's not so efficient actually are, are more likely to stay slim. And there were a bunch of other things about, uh, you know, the kind of relationship between um, environmental toxins and obesity mm -hmm. and, and all that back and forth. And I just wondered if you, you know, how, if at all, you think it figures in, or maybe it's just too obscure to even be worth thinking about when there's so many other things we can Well, do. yeah, I think, I think there's, a, there's, there's always going to be that. There's always a lot of research to look at the the sort of you know the, the cellular level, or the very kind of um, small scale. Um, I wouldn't like to comment on that particular study because I, I, I think I know what you mean, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, but these kind of things, yeah, we don't know. This is the trouble. Um, 
But I think we, we have to accept that whatever is going on, there is a problem, and that problem needs, address, needs addressing. And I, I mean, I, I've just you know heard your presentation recently where you were talking about some of the environmental toxin work, which is really interesting. And I think again, it's an example. Of, you know, what are we doing? We're, you know, there's lots of things going on there. So, so again, I'm, I, I think yes, interesting, but we need to focus on the, the solution, perhaps. Hi, Jessie. Thank you very much for your. Sorry, I couldn't catch the last part of that. Can you just maybe there, I don't I don't know if there's any any research that's been done looking at obesity on sort of the community level basis in within Nova Scotia rather than the entire province and just anything um, any thoughts you might have on addressing the issue at a community um, level, particularly right. with regards to uh, community health board. Yeah, I I can't speak for the research in Nova Scotia specifically because I don't think there has been any. And I'm looking at Trent. Would you shake my head? So I no, I don't think there has been any. Specifically in Nova Scotia, I would have to go back to the literature and have a look and see if there was anything. Um, but certainly, community level interventions are have been done, um, and we can learn from them. And uh, you know, that's a conversation perhaps we can have um, at some point because, yeah, I think there's lots of things that we can do at that level. Okay. I kind of had a two-part question. The first part was to clarify something you said in the presentation, and then the second part is on that. When you said um, for to eat healthy for a week, it would cost five fifty to six hundred. Was that for an individual or? For oh, sorry, no, that was for a household. Sorry, okay. I should have made that clear. I think that's household figures. It was a family. Yeah, for a month. Yeah, for a month. For a month. It was a family of four. Yes. For a month. For a month. Okay. For family. Um, oh, it was. Yeah. The, the one from amount today was a family of four for a month. And it's six hundred and forty dollars. Right, so it's gone up. I mean, it was two thousand and three. The figures that I was presenting. So, uh, uh, but the one that was just on CBC today was six hundred and forty for a family of four. Right. So I added up in my credit card what we spent for family of five. Six hundred and seven. And it's what sort? My family for a family of five was for a month. I just got the credit card bill and looked at what we spent at the grocery store. And it was six hundred and seventy. Right. So it's pretty accurate for yeah. my basic healthy food. All right, thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Any other? Um, okay, and I guess it doesn't really link up anymore, but uh, uh, my other question was, if if healthy food is so expensive and we have such a problem with food security, what can we do about it? Like, government subsidization or, or what? Yeah, I think that's one of the issues that we need to, to fully understand, actually, and that's a bit of a cop-out, I know, but we do need to, to look at that because, you know, what happens if you give people more money? Will they spend it on healthier foods? And the evidence is that they will, um, actually. From uh, I think that's uh, oh, where those figures came from now, but I do know that um, that people, if there are, is more uh, more healthy, um, if people have more income, they will spend on things like fruit and vegetables that they don't currently have. Um, but it's something that we do need to understand a little bit more as to whether or not you know that is the solution. My instinct is that yes, it is. You know, if people don't have enough to themselves, then, then that is a, a policy issue. Yeah, I'm just thinking that the majority of the population can afford enough food, and when you go to grocery store, you see so many people with that massive section in the grocery store that's like free on, free on food, you know, it's probably doubled in the last few years. So it's like, obviously people want to buy this food. Yeah. Market forces. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not quite sure what your point was there. <laughs> Do you want to no, know? I'm just saying, if you, um, I just find it hard to believe that if you give people more money that they're going to, that they're going to buy the healthy food because the majority of the population can afford healthy food and they're not buying it. Right. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If I, so, if, yes. Um, if I can, I think one of the biggest challenges is going to be food security in the long run. And let me give you an example. With the tobacco strategy in Nova Scotia started in 99, all key stakeholders, everybody engaged over a period of seven years, we went from worst to first mm -hmm. with youth rates. But you could easily say, if somebody quit smoking of a lower socioeconomic, 
they didn't go to something else. But if you're trying to drive them to eat healthy and they can't afford to, mm -hmm. that's the challenge. Yeah. So that, that's where we need the kinds of things that you're talking about and how we best focus. And I like the gentleman's quote about if we wait for the perfect, it'll be too late. Yeah. So we've got to do some things in the short term and do them well, but yeah. keep our eye on the long term, Absolutely. which is food security. Yeah. I totally agree. That's, that's, that's really important. I think that's what your research yeah. is telling us. Yeah. And just to go back to your, your point about well, people you know, don't buy these things now, no, they don't because it's the easy choice. And if we can make the easy cho the healthy choice the easy choice, maybe that will make it easy for people to do it. something and we're going to have to make changes at a, a much broader level than perhaps we have done before and I think this is the thing where we, we focus on the individual then you know we, we we're ignoring a lot of the, the sort of environmental stuff but if we focus just on the environment then we're ignoring the individual and I think we've got to do you know it's uh, you know the point is we have to do both you know this your gentleman's point about you know um, we do need to have individual um, targeting as well but we need to put that in the context of the environment and you know I, I People who know me know that I'm not one to sort of like sit on one side of the fence or the other. I mean, I think it's a balance and we need to get that, that kind of balance between both, really. Sarah, on the early slide, it showed uh, female to male yes. obesity rates, and there seemed to be a dramatic male to female in Nova Scotia. Yeah. Don't worry too much about that. that was, that's, um, that's the figures because um, the Canadian Community Health Survey is, is still quite a small sample. Okay. So what you get there is a there's, there's a, a, a large error of um, variation. Okay. In the, so. <laughs> it seems dramatic. Yeah, it does. Thank it does. you. Um, given that um, there are a number of uh, people in respondents, and I'm not sure of the exact percentage because it varies, and I haven't seen current numbers, people who live below the low income cutoff, or folks who are in social assistance, people who are trying to uh, get by on minimum wage, mm -hmm. um, there's no way that they have the six hundred and forty dollars for the food. Yeah. It wouldn't matter what choices they could make, they just don't have enough money, period, for that. So what kind of uh, interventions have you uh, experienced or have you thought about in your research that would address this low-income sector of the population and also people who are more marginalized in terms of geography or social support yeah. or, or can't get transport to get the food? Um, I didn't, uh, can you just talk a little bit about how that... So you're asking about interventions? Well, what kind, I, I didn't hear you addressing it when you were talking about the kind of the environment. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear a piece about that whole population and yeah. the environment. That's because there is very little research in that area. I think that is the major problem that we have. Is you're absolutely right, there's a whole population that we're not actually targeting, and they are completely ignored. They're ignored in the research literature as well as in, you know, in, in, in other ways as well. So um, I think in terms of you know what interventions have we done, pretty much none. <laughs> it's not an area that's been particularly well researched. So my point would be then that that would be a really critical area for there to be the messy research. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And what we need to start doing is having more, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking about the, the minimum wage increase. <coughs> we have through the costing data, and I think that's going to be really <coughs> interesting to see what happens once the minimum wage increase occurs. Um, but I think we do need to have um, other things as well. So yeah, um, natural experiments are the, probably the way that we have to do a lot of this. We're going to have to do something, but what we do, we need to we need to be evaluating it well and making sure that we get the answers that uh, that we need to, to inform these kind of decisions. Has there been any studies linking the use of industrial organic food as opposed to non-organic food in, in relation to obesity? Not that I'm aware of. Um, who's so immersed in the nutrition is <laughs> I don't think we have done, that there's nothing specific about, about it in terms of obesity, I don't think. Um, there's, a, there's research on it by organic food versus non-organic food, but uh, I don't think I've seen anything specifically related to um, obesity. So is there a connection between um, non-organic food that has chemical processes at all? Is there a connection between using chemicals I think Barbara should be answering that because you were, you were presenting about that recently, weren't you? Again, it's, it's hazy, isn't it? There's, you know, 
know, there are suggestions that there may be something going on, but but it's 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 not particularly strong. I don't think. But you've seen some stuff. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. It's, uh, there are some really suggestive studies about the relationship between environmental uh, or toxic substances and <coughs> and spirits, and it's something that we do need to think about here in Nova Scotia because um, because of the geography and the wind mm -hmm. patterns across the continent mm -hmm. and the and the tidal patterns and all those kinds of things, as well as as homegrown issues like tar the tar ponds and things like that, that they're you know, they're they're beginning to see things like pretty drastic reduction in the age of puberty for girls yeah. in the United States, which may well be linked to increased exposure to hormones in food and in the environment more broadly, and the relationship between increased levels of hormones uh, and obesity does seem to be suggestive, but yes. I think you're right, there needs to be a lot more research. Yeah. So does that answer your question? Just uh, one more question about um, cultural influences. Um, I was in Kuwait once and was taken out for lunch by this gentleman who was most offended that I didn't eat everything in the place. Mm. Um, he took that as a little bit of an insult when I had my you know, salad and yeah, a little bit of entree. Mm. Uh, he was flabbergasted that I, that was all I was going to eat. Mm. Is, are there many, much cultural Influences? Are there yes, many there, yes influences? there are. And there's a lot of research into that actually. And in fact, I um, I've um, recently had a paper published that was done in, in Tonga. Um, I didn't go to Tonga, it was um, the medical students who were working with me. And, um, you know, even their, their sort of attitudes about body size are very different. It's actually considered to be good to be overweight in, in Tonga. And they underestimate their. Uh, well, under, well, under, I don't know which way it goes now, but, but they, they believe themselves to be thinner than they are. And so there's, there's a lot around whether or not we even should have the same BMI categories for, for certain populations and others. And, and that's another, again, another round of lecture, I should imagine. But it's, um, yeah, there's a lot about that. And, and, and food is, it's, it's you know, as we know ourselves, for all the complications that we have for eating food, Christmas and Easter, and, you know, we, it, it's a very cultural thing. And, and there's a lot about that in terms of, you know, um, what people's expectations are, of <coughs> what you should eat or not eat, and, you know, whether you are offending them or And I used to be shocked, actually, that these, these, these young um, students would come in. They hadn't even got a clue about cooking. They were here to study about food, you know. <laughs> Seems a little bit sort of bizarre to me, really. But, um, and I, I actually agree. I think there is a, an issue there. And, and oh, gosh, I can tell you a few things about um, the, um, the average time for preparing a meal is about 20 minutes now. And, and uh, so, you know, it, we're looking for things that are quick and easy, and that's why we go for, for the processed food. Um, and I think there is something around doing these sort of cooking sessions or 
um, encouraging kids particularly to get involved with cooking to feel food. And, you know, this isn't a new problem actually, this is something that has gone on for, for a long time. I worked in Glasgow a long time ago, in fact I was a, when I was a student. Um, and in Glasgow, the eating habits in Scotland, the eating habits are, are pretty poor, were pretty poor. Um, Scotland's introduced deep fried Mars bars, and I knew it would make George laugh. Mars bars being a chocolate, do you know, have you, do you have Mars bars here? Yeah, they're right. <laughs> you don't eat them very often. <laughs> so, um, and, and that's the, that's what, that was a sort of like a Scottish de delicacy, but anyway, I, I digress. The point is, when I was working with um, low-income youth there, and um, we found that, uh, you know, kids that hadn't even seen an egg in a shell, they hadn't seen, they didn't see carrots, and, and literally they thought that tomato ketchup was a vegetable because that is their main exposure to it. And I mean, you laugh, but it's true. It actually did, you know, these were kids who, who didn't even know, you know, again, where meat comes from, for example. And uh, I think there is an issue around that. Um, you know, we've taken these things out of the curriculum and, and, and you know, we're not equipping people with those skills. They've got to get them somewhere. And we don't all, you know, stay at home with our, our mums or our parents who are, who are cooking food. You know, sometimes we're not doing it. So, um, a good point. Thank you. Actually, in the days that it was called that, I think it changed to yeah. something else, food and nutrition or something. Like that. Yeah. I think schools, schools like gym teachers and women teachers are, are really, and cafeterias, yeah. are really cheap investment short term but with the eye on the long term because I think this is the problem you know we make we make decisions sometimes and they turn out that they're not the best of decisions but we've then got to kind of reverse those and that takes time and it's interesting because I, I you know I mean I, I've come here very recently so I've been you know living in the, the UK all my life um, and a lot of the debates that are going on here have actually already happened in the UK because we are a little bit ahead of you in terms of um, or us, as I say now, but in terms of um, obesity rates in the UK, and in, in, and obviously we're here, we're we're not as bad as the US, nor in the UK. But um, and I'm rambling again. But what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that we took um, kitchens out of schools in the UK, um, and then Jamie Oliver came along. You all heard about Jamie Oliver, and <laughs> it's funny everybody's heard about Jamie Oliver. Here. Um, and Jamie Oliver made a huge difference in a way that you know, as a dietitian, I never could do. You know, I would have been, you know, we would been years trying to make that kind of difference. Um, but he put a show on and, 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 and really captivated everybody. But just before I left the UK, and I apologize to Tara and Lisa who've heard this story before, and maybe a few other ones of you, but when, um, when the, 
in the UK there was a particular school in the in the um, place that I was living. I lived in the uh, county of Yorkshire, and um, in a place called Rotherham, they had uh, a school nutrition policy in place. And this was for I think they must have been what would be the equivalent of sort of junior high or high school kids. Um, and the parents were up in arms, and they were going out at lunchtime and buying McDonald's and <laughs> fish and chips. Um, and taking them and passing them over the school gates. And, and I think it just highlights the need to engage everybody. And, you know, and that the decisions to, to do the, uh, the healthy menus in, in schools I think is fantastic. But the kids need to be supported to, to have those choices because they may not have them at home. Um, and you know, the, the, the cafeteria needs to be applauded for doing that. Um, but we also need to sort of look at what we're doing in our environment. If you know, we're saying one thing and then we're, you know, we're, we're demonstrating another thing, it's it's just not making sense, and and that's always going to be the problem we have as well. You know, it's a it's a free economy at the end of the day, and, and we have a choice to make. But uh, it's helping people, equipping them with the the, the, the skills and the um, the tools that they need to make the healthy choices. And that isn't easy, and that's going to take a long, long time. And I, you know, I'm here sort of thinking, oh gosh, you know, there's just so much to do, but I think we'll do it one step at a time and we see where we go. But we recognize this is a generational problem. We're not going to solve this problem overnight. And we could literally be three, four, five, even longer generations before we actually make a difference. Yeah. Just a comment, I really like your, your, your opinion on it. In the public health position, I think we are, we need to reframe the debate and the issues. You touched on it, and for some of the reasons and some others, I think we need to move away from talking about the problem and the epidemic of obesity and developing strategies around to deal with obesity and move to talking about our ep epidemics of inactivity and unhealthy eating and the solutions around developing strategies linked on those two <coughs> issues. Because I think it just helps. That reframing, I think, is very important. Well, I would challenge you that we also we have to have that debate about obesity. I think I, I agree with you totally. We need a we need to consider these other things because at the end of the day, physical activity is good for everybody. It's not just people who have a weight problem. Healthy eating is good for everybody as well. But I, I think the problem with just you know just saying right okay, um, doing healthy eating, doing physical activity is that we we don't recognise the energy balance equation and the fact that that you know the environment is so so obesogenic at the moment. If all we did was tell people to be more physically active and to, to eat a healthy diet. That may not be enough. I mean, I, I think we need both. I'm not I'm suggesting saying. it's a, a telling people. It's okay. approaching as a comprehensive environmental yeah. oh, approach absolutely. to promote, but mm -hmm. framing it around a, a, an epidemics of physical inactivity yeah. and epidemics of unhealthy eating, yeah. which broaden the debate or move it, help us move it away from the individual. Yeah. But I think we have that debate already, and I think, you know, my, my sort of um, worry is that we have that debate and we, we still don't address the obesogenic environment because we are physically inactive and we are, um, you know, on the whole not eating taking a healthy diet. Um, but, but that is actually something that's, a, you know, a lot more focus tends to go on that than, than, than maybe it does on the obesity side of things. So, but I totally agree, a comprehensive approach, you can't just do one thing, it has to be a whole different, literally a portfolio of approaches that we need um, and addressing these at all these different levels, prevention, treatment, you know, it's, it all needs to be looked at, really. Thank you. My goodness, that was a big debate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Gentlemen, my name is George Turnbull, and I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Academic in the Faculty of Health Professions. And Joe Byrne asked me to make a few closing remarks uh, about this particular talk. And I've picked up a few threads in the evening uh, as I've listened to Sarah. The, the one thing I have to take a little bit of exception to is the fried Mars bars. <laughs> this, was a, this is a recent invention. I think uh, it was a deal between a confectionery outfit and uh, a fish frying outfit and they were having a fight about where they sell the products and they ended up coming up with a fried Mars bar and I've no idea, I've never tasted one and I never will. <laughs> this is not a pretty picture that Sarah's painted tonight but it's an extremely important one and I think she's made the point very clearly that this is 
multifactorial in the greatest sense of, of uh, the, the problem. Um, my wife is a, a, an ardent shopper. <clears throat> She's one of these people who can remember the price uh, of food on sale at Sobeys versus uh, Superstore versus Pete's Fruitique versus uh, Costco. And she makes some very interesting observations, and she's very, she's always commenting me, commenting to me, about the weight difference from the people that shop at Walmart versus the people that shop at the farmers market in Pete's Fruitique. And it's an interesting phenomenon, and I would advise you just to have a look casually one day, and it's not uh, hard to find uh, quite a significant difference. Um, You've been, the co hospital cafeteria was mentioned today. Well, during the winter, I park at Fenwick and I cut through the hospital, which includes going past the uh, cafeteria. I'm appalled at what people are eating. It's absolutely disgusting. It looks good. It looks wonderful. And it very much appeals to how I was brought up in some ways. Uh, but it really, there needs to be something done about that. Uh, Dr. Ray LeBlanc, who's the VP research at the Capital Health, was telling me that he was at some uh, recognition um, uh, event the other day, a breakfast, and he was sitting with a man who's had uh, two double bypasses and two stents put in, and he has a pacemaker. And guess what they served for the meal for the breakfast? Bacon and eggs and toast, which I thought was rather interesting. Um, so, you know, people who should know better, really don't, haven't reached the sensitive level yet. And I think it's Sarah's work that will allow us to begin to see where these things are coming from. Um, <clears throat> I also, a few weeks ago, uh, was in Amsterdam, and I was astonished by A, the number of bicycles, and B, by the number of uh, opportunities to use the bicycles and bike lanes. The whole city is set up for that. <coughs> And I was surprised at how few really obese people I saw. So there's a very, even women uh, cycling with a child in the front of the bike and one in the back. They didn't have helmets on, though I did point that out. Um, but nonetheless, they were uh, pedaling. Um, I thought the comment about cooking tonight was absolutely uh, wonderful. One of the things I've taught my two sons how to do is to cook, because I like to cook myself. Um, it's... Uh, Indian food, but nonetheless, it's wonderful, healthy, and uh, my younger son uh, has just announced he's become a vegetarian because uh, he just, I think it's a fad, it's like the pink hair he used to have, I think. <laughs> but to close on a, a perhaps an inappropriate analogy, this is going to take a long time. It's going to be like eating an elephant, one bite at a time, but I'm sure with Sarah's help and guidance, and the recognition of Duff's department and all of our collective wisdom and energy, uh, we can get this right because there's no question that the Darwinian type of model that Sarah showed uh, is, is happening. And it's a great worry to all of us in the healthcare sector. So Sarah, many thanks for a wonderful talk. I was riveted, quite frankly. I didn't think I would be, but I was. A whole <laughs> hour, and it was just great. No, no offense. Or anything. And, Thank you from all of us uh, for this wonderful talk tonight, and we wish you well in your future research. I know that you will do very well, and your, your study, uh, the study area that you've chosen is extremely timely and extremely important. And I'd just like to ask David uh, Persaud to come up for a moment or two. Thank you, Sarah. I've been asked to remind you to fill out the opinion forms. Uh, we value your opinion, so just take the time to do it. We have a very nice uh, gift for Sarah uh, to th show our appreciation and to thank her for uh, giving us this skinny on this weighty subject. <laughs> <laughs>